but he also has a former PhD student among our faculty, Tom Ahern, and among our center um, faculty. And so I'm going to invite Tom up to do a proper introduction. So, Tom. Hello, everybody. Nobody's here to listen to me talk, um, but I want to introduce to you our esteemed speaker today, Tim Lash, uh, who was, as Steve said, my uh, thesis mentor and um, everything else mentor since uh, I finished my thesis. Uh, Tim completed uh, MPH and Doctor of Science degrees in epidemiology at the Boston University School of Public Health, where he then served on faculty for 10 years and then moved to the Department of Clinical Epidemiology at Aarhus University in Denmark, where much of his research is based. And he's currently Rollins Chair and Professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. I can uh, pick a few highlights from a most distinguished career. Um, his CV is 45 pages long, and it's all killer, no filler, I guarantee you. Um, a few highlights from that. Uh, he's the leader of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at the Winship Cancer Institute, editor-in-chief of the esteemed journal Epidemiology, uh, editor of the popular and rigorous textbook Modern Epidemiology, which I hope is on all of your shelves, and uh, has developed revolutionary techniques for quantitative assessment and correction of systematic biases in epidemiologic studies. On top of that, an extensive and very diverse portfolio of applied research, much of it in uh, breast cancer survival. And um, beating all of those is uh, his dedication and generosity as a mentor. So very pleased to have him here today to give us this thought-provoking talk. We'll have time for questions at the end. And whatever you do, do not tell him that it's 75 degrees and sunny back home in Atlanta. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I, it's been my great pleasure to work with Tom for um, 15 years, I guess, as a, initially as a student and then as a colleague. And he's always told me how great it is in Burlington. So it's been nice to finally be here and, and to see that, in fact, it is a really lovely place. Um, so today's talk is on uh, the reproducibility crisis. And um, the uh, outline is to just briefly remind you of the problem. I'm not going to delve into all of the literature that has been published on the reproducibility crisis, so we'll just have to assume that at least a large part of our community believes that there's a culture in the reproducibility of scientific work. Uh, the meat of the talk is in showing four ways that I think that null hypothesis significance testing has harmed reproducibility. Uh, and then I will just briefly go over some of the proposed remedies which I uh, think would likely be ineffective and then show an alternative prescription which you can guess is let's stop significance testing. So you have to leave early. I don't want you to be left out. But. So the problem. Um, in the last few years, stakeholders in the scientific community and in the lay press have been um, perseverating over an alarms that the scientific uh, enterprise is not sufficiently reproducible. Uh, you can see that in papers like this that was in The Economist. Scientists like to think of science as self-correcting. To an alarming degree, it is not. Uh, this was 2013 in one of the early papers in the lay press on the reproducibility crisis. Um, Nature in 2016 published a survey of practicing scientists asking the question of whether or not they think there is a reproducibility crisis. Half said that yes, there is a significant crisis. 38% yes said that there's a slight crisis, which, yeah. 3% <laughs> um, said that there's no crisis, and 7% answered don't know, which I think is probably the right answer. I mean, in order to know that something's reproducible and there's a crisis, you would have to know what the truth is, which we never really know. So don't know is actually the intellectually honest answer to this question. 7% got the answer right. Um, those of you who work with the NIH and submit grants under their purview uh, know that there's been a push uh, for grant writers to address rigor and reproducibility in their grants and uh, study section review panels to include this in their evaluation criteria. 
And so funders are getting into the game under the premise that there is a reproducibility crisis. So I could go on and on, but uh, the lay press, the scientific community, the scientific press, and funders think that there's a reproducibility crisis. That's really uh, where things stand. So how does null hypothesis significance testing contribute to the reproducibility crisis? Um, there's a direct link between innovation and reproducibility and null hypothesis significance testing. And in fact, the genesis of this talk and the paper that appeared in the American Journal of Epidemiology, that, that is the rigorous presentation of this work, emanated from a discussion that I had at a scientific meeting where someone from the National Cancer Institute was talking about new NIH standards for rigor and reproducibility. And I raised my hand and, and said, well, isn't this going to have an impact diminishing innovation? And, and she basically laughed at me and said, no, the two are not at all connected. Innovation and reproducibility, there's no connection between the two. So I sheepishly went back to my seat, and when I went back to my office, started writing this paper, because I think that there is a direct link. Uh, so before we get to that link, just a reminder of the growing prevalence and importance of innovation in our scientific enterprise. This is just uh, a clever paper that I read in 2016, where the authors searched in PubMed over 20, uh, 40 years for the prevalence of the words innovative, groundbreaking, and novel in the abstracts that appear in PubMed. That prevalence increased 25-fold over that 40-year period. So one could believe that the innovation of the scientific enterprises increased 25-fold over 40 years, or you could believe that we have realized that these key words get attention. And, and I think it's probably more likely that. But that's a marker that innovation is important. And if you write an NIH grant, you have to have a section that's labeled innovation and make the claim to the review panel of how your work is, in fact, innovative. The problem is that there's a direct link between innovation and reproducibility in a culture that relies on null hypothesis significance testing. So to show you this, I need you to conceptualize a, a diagnostic test where we use the type 1 error rate, the type 2 error rate as the standards for a positive or negative test. And the p-value is the result of the diagnostic test. So the p-value is then compared to the acceptable type 1 error rate. And that gives you 1 minus alpha is the specificity of the test. Power, 1 minus beta, is the sensitivity of the test. So your null two-sided p-value is the test result. In that case, the positive predictive value depends on the prevalence of the truly non-null hypotheses in the research enterprise. So any particular test results, positive predictive value of whether or not the result is true depends on the prevalence of true hypotheses in the research enterprise. And in an innovative research enterprise, this prevalence is likely to be low. And in a mundane research enterprise, this prevalence is likely to be higher. So let's just see an example. Let's imagine this innovative research enterprise where we're going to do 10,000 studies generating 10,000 p-values, and that of those 10,000 studies, 100 are studies for which the null hypothesis is truly wrong. So there's a truly non-null association. So the prevalence is 100 out of 10,000 is 1%. So this is a really innovative, we're pushing the envelope, most of what we're studying turns out not to be true. So then the prevalence of truly null hypotheses in this research enterprise is 99%. Now let's imagine that the power of the studies is 80%. That's often a standard for an acceptably powered study. Then out of our 100 truly non-null hypotheses, 80 of them would generate, would be expected to generate a statistically significant result. So those are the 80 that get the most attention, right? Those are the 80 with statistically significant results, and they are coming from truly non-null hypotheses. 20 of the 100 will not be found. If we use a type 1 error rate of 5%, we will also find 495 statistically significant results 
four hypotheses that were truly null because we've accepted a 5% false positive rate. So we will have 575 statistically significant results. And only 80 of those will be of truly non-null hypotheses. So the positive predictive value of a statistically significant result in this research enterprise is only 14%. Many people think, well, this is just a problem of poor power, but it's not. If you make the power 100%, the positive predictive value only goes up to 17%. The problem here is that you have an innovative research enterprise, and most hypotheses are not truly, are not non-null, and therefore, the true positives are swamped by the false positives. This is just the same as many diagnostic settings that you have. This is why we screen populations that are at high risk instead of entire populations. Right? This is why we do mammography screening in women who are 55 years old or older, 50 years old or older, and not 30 years old because the prevalence of breast cancer is too low in 30-year-old women. You get too many false positives. So if we then subject those 575 statistically significant results to a reproducibility exercise, a second study of only those 575, 64 of the 80 would be expected to replicate, and 25 or 5% 5 of the 495 false positives would also replicate. So our final tally is that we find 64 reproduced truly non-null hypotheses, 36 false negative results, and 25 reproduced false positive results. So if you add up right to wrong, the ratio is almost one to one, 64 to 61. This is the reproducibility crisis. Now, if you want good reproducibility, the way to do it is, and you want to hang on to statistical significance testing, then the way to get there is to study what you already know. So if we change the prevalence of hypotheses that are truly non-null from 1% to 50%, now the positive predictive value of a statistically significant result is 94%. And if we submit the statistically significant results to a reproducibility exercise, the second study of the same hypotheses, then our final tally will truly outweigh. Right answers will truly outweigh wrong answers. So if you want good reproducibility and you want to hang on to statistical significance testing as an inferential method, and you want good reproducibility, then you have to study what you already know. You'll do very well. If you want innovation and good reproducibility, then you can't have statistical significance testing. These three things cannot coexist. Innovation, good reproducibility, and null hypothesis significance testing, these three things cannot coexist, which was my point to the NCI program officer and why I decided I ought to write this paper. But then I thought, well, there's more to say. So in epidemiology, there has been, uh, 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 for a long time, a call to focus on estimation instead of on significance testing. Don't worry about whether the p-value is above or below a particular threshold, typically 0.05. Just give us your point estimate of the effect and a 95% confidence interval around it. And this started with a paper that one of my mentors, Ken Rothman, wrote that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1978. And he said, you know, what matters here is the position of the interval on the scale of measurement. Significance testing funnels all the interest into the precise location at one boundary of the confidence interval. Does the interval overlap the null or not? He says, in the past, journals have encouraged routine use of tests of statistical significance. 
but the time has come to encourage routine use of intervals instead. And after this paper appeared, at least in the field of epidemiology, you could see a groundswell change in the way results are presented. This was studied in uh, a paper that appeared in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 19, uh, shortly after 1990. But what they found was that there was a change in the way results were presented. So people did present the point estimate and the interval, but there was not a change in the way they were interpreted. So intervals and estimates were prevented, presented, but the focus was still to emphasize statistically significant results. In other words, intervals that excluded the null. This is not an improvement. This is what I call closet significance testing, right? If you're presenting estimates and intervals, but you're still only focusing on the ones that are statistically significant, nothing really has changed. The way the result is presented has changed, but the selection forces have not changed. And this is the situation that I would say um, continues to this day. Now what is oftentimes not understood about these selection forces is that it causes us to overestimate the thing that we're interested in. Let me show you an example. So this is kind of the typical depiction of null hypothesis significance testing. We have on the x-axis hypotheses on some scale. These could be risk ratios or risk differences or other effect estimates, regression coefficients. And then the y-axis is just probability density. So the blue curve is the probability density under the null hypothesis. And the red dashed curve is the probability density under some alternative hypothesis, which is the truth. All right? And the vertical black line is the testing boundary. So the area under the blue curve to the right of that testing boundary, this piece shaded here, is 0.025 if your acceptable type 1 error rate is 0.05. And the area under the red curve to the left of the testing interval, that's beta. Power is 1 minus beta. So in this depiction, we have 80% power. All right, so this is the conventional depiction of power and type 1, type 2 error rates under the null hypothesis significance testing framework. Your study, any particular study, is a sample from this red dashed line. So the expectation would be that your sample would come from the center of it, and then samples that come out in this direction would be less and less likely to be obtained. Now, why does this matter? Well, if we're only going to pay attention to statistically significant results, we should ask, well, are those likely to be underestimates or overestimates of the truth? Right? So here in this depiction, the area under the red dashed line to the left of the testing interval is almost zero. So we have 100% power. Our study's result will be a sample from the red dashed line. The expectation is at the center, and it's about the same probability that you will get an underestimate as it is that you will get an overestimate. Right? Because the space available that is statistically significant to the right of this line is about the same amount of space under the density sampling for underestimates and overestimates. But what if the power is 80%? If the power is 80%, and we're going to take a sample for our study from this red dashed line, but we're only going to pay attention to the result if it's statistically significant, it's much more likely that we will obtain an overestimate of the truth than an underestimate of the truth. We have all this space to the right that is an overestimate and only that small space between the vertical testing line and the center of the red dashed line for underestimates. If the power is 
and you're only going to pay attention to statistically significant results, you cannot get an underestimate of the truth. Mathematically impossible. And we know this. This is regression to the mean, right? Your first sample, if it's statistically significant, is likely to yield an overestimate of the truth. And your replication study will regress towards the mean, which is the center point. Uh, we know this in clinical trials stopped early. If you stop a clinical trial early for effect, you know the direction, presumably benefit, but the actual estimate of effect is likely to be overestimated by the trial because you have stopped before you reached the design power. People know that. Subgroup analyses. Oftentimes, you take your data, you divide it in two, you get a big effect in one of the subgroups. That subgroup is not the design-powered subgroup, so the estimate in the subgroup is likely to be an overestimate. And the people who work in the replication field know this also. This is a figure that appeared in the science paper in 2015 that was the watershed event for the reproducibility crisis. And what they did was to plot effect sizes for the original estimate. That's the green curve. That's the density at the top. You can see that Green represents statistically significant results, and red represent results that are not statistically significant. And in this replication exercise, almost all initial point estimates were statistically significant. The other side of the scatter plot is the replication estimate of effect. This ascending diagonal is the identity line, and what you can see is that the majority of the points fall below that line. That's regression to the mean. No surprise. And about half of the replication estimates were not statistically significant, even though the initial estimate was statistically significant. So none of this is a surprise. If you only pay attention to statistically significant results, on average, you will overestimate the true effect. And when you try to reproduce that, you'll get regression to the mean, on average. What is surprising to me is that these authors pointed this out in the 2015 science paper, and nowhere in that paper do they make the suggestion that maybe we should stop significance testing. That idea, which is the fundamental reason for this, never was proposed. Third way that significance testing gets in the way of reproducibility. Conventional analyses account only for random error. That p-value, that 95% confidence interval, all that is incorporated in that is sampling error. In many studies, the dominant source of uncertainty is something else, selection bias, or measurement bias, or uh, uncontrolled co covariates. These are sources of uncertainty that are not typically incorporated into quantitative analyses. So our conventional analyses only account for random error, even though systematic errors often dominate the uncertainty they seldom get a quantitative treatment. Instead, we write about them in the last paragraph of our discussion section. You know, this paper is not without limitations. And then you confess your sins and offer yourself absolution. Right? That's the usual way that we treat systematic errors in scientific research. Even though there have been known quantitative methods to account for these other sources of uncertainty since the 1950s. So what does this p-value actually measure? This p-value that's involved in null hypothesis significance testing 
is the probability that a test statistic computed from the data would be greater than or equal to its observed value under two assumptions, assuming that the null hypothesis is true and assuming that there's no other source of bias. No uncontrolled confounding, no selection bias, no measurement error, no other systematic data generating mechanism. What are some other systematic data generating mechanisms? Fraud is a systematic data generating mechanism. So you're assuming that there's no fraud when you calculate the p-value. But there are also other systematic data generating mechanisms that we need to take into account. P-hacking and harking, these are systematic data generating mechanisms that I'll talk about later in the, in the hour. So the p-value is a measure of the consistency of the data with all of these assumptions, but the only one that we tend to pay attention with is the null hypothesis assumption. So if the p-value falls below this type 1 error rate, and we accept the result as statistically significant, then we reject the null hypothesis. When, in fact, any of the underlying assumptions might be wrong. Lack of bias, lack of other systematic generating mechanisms. Why do we routinely reject the null hypothesis instead of allowing for the possibility that our small p-value is actually due to one of these other things. Well, one of the reasons is that it's what we want, right? We want to reject the null hypothesis. We don't want to reject the hypothesis that the result's due to bias. That we will, like, we're willing to tolerate that. But it's also what we're taught. So here are introductory epidemiology texts, four of them. I'm not going to read them for you, but the highlighted text in each section, in each of these texts, what I've done is excerpted their definition of the p-value and null hypothesis significance testing. And in each text, they talk about assuming the null hypothesis is true or rejecting the null hypothesis, but they nowhere mention bias, lack of bias, or lack of other data generating mechanisms as also assumptions underlying the p-value calculation. So we are only taught in all four of the leading introductory epidemiology texts, including one authored by Ken Rothman, that it's only the null hypothesis that we need to worry about as an assumption underlying the p-value calculation. So different studies have different biases affecting them. There's design and analysis features that affect this influence of systematic errors, this selection bias, measurement bias, uh, unmeasured confounding. And they're acting differently in each study in the set of studies on a particular topic. And so this different susceptibility to these different biases probably explains some of what appears to be poor reproducibility. Two studies of the same topic, one with mismeasured outcome and one with well-measured outcome, you should not expect that they would have the same effect estimate. But they are routinely compared to each other without accounting for the fact that they are differentially susceptible to mismeasurement of the outcome. There are quantitative methods to adjust estimates for these systematic errors. They've been known for decades, but they are seldom used. So why not? Well, the second you go down this road of adjusting for systematic errors, you have to give up the null hypothesis significance testing paradigm because there's no room in that calculation of the p-value for a quantitative comparison with a type 1 error rate that involves anything other than random error. So when you go down the road of trying to quantify something that's not random error, the whole null hypothesis significance testing framework falls apart. And we want that framework. 
Okay, number four, prior information. We never, or very seldom these days, take account of the fact that we know a lot about what we're studying and that that can provide a basis for understanding poor reproducibility. So that means we have to talk about the B word, Bayes. Bayes methods. And the reason is that taking advantage of prior information appropriately, rigorously reduces the appearance of heterogeneous results. So let me just give you an example from a topic area that Tom and I work in. These are studies of whether particular genetic variants that knock out one of the genes that metabolize and therefore activate tamoxifen, that these genetic variants might reduce the effectiveness of tamoxifen in preventing breast cancer recurrence. And at the time we put this together, uh, there had been 27 studies associating these particular gene variants with breast cancer outcomes, and the results are highly heterogeneous. So here's just a, my depiction of a forest plot, like you might see in a meta-analysis. And you can see that some studies estimate highly protective effect of carrying these genetic variants. Other studies estimate a highly causal or increased risk of carrying these genetic variants, and then everything in between. Right? So this is a highly heterogeneous uh, set of studies, 27 point estimates, each with their 95% confidence intervals. And you can subject this to a test of homogeneity, you get P equals 0.034. Now what we forget is that underlying this is a prior. And in this case, this presentation, that prior assumes that anything from a highly protective effect to a null effect, to a highly causal effect, is equally likely. There is an embedded, non-informative prior in frequentist statistics. And so I've represented that here with this infinite blue line as the unrecognized, non-informative prior. But we know a lot about tamoxifen. Clinical trials have told us that tamoxifen reduces the recurrence rate by half. So with a little bit of adjustment, it's hard to believe that carrying a gene that knocks out a gene that metabolizes tamoxifen, that should not more than double the risk of recurrence. If the benefit is a reduction by half, then women who get no benefit should have about twice the risk of recurrence is women who get full benefit. Furthermore, there's no biologic rationale, no one's ever suggested that carrying these variants should protect you against breast cancer recurrence. Right? This is about making the drug fully effective. So carrying the knockout variants, you shouldn't get a protective effect. So we can draw this region of reasonability over our study results, ranging from the null to about a doubling on the log scale. And you can see that many of the point estimates from these studies fall outside of the reason, region of reasonability. And we could do a little bit more than that. We can actually quantify that. We can assign a prior. Let's just choose one that's centered on the log of hazard ratio of two over two with limits 0.5 to 0.4. So that non-informative prior shrinks to this. You know, let's figure that 95% chance that the true association lies in that range. And then we can use inverse variance weighting methods to just combine that prior with each one of these point estimates, poor man's Bayes analysis, and the heterogeneity just about disappears. Now we get this very nice distribution that looks exactly like what you would expect if you were just sampling from a null-centered prior, right? And all we've done here is to take into account quantitatively well-known biology of tamoxifen 
well-known effectiveness from clinical trials. The underlying information informing this prior, so far as I know, is without dispute. If we just took it into account quantitatively, what appears to be a super heterogeneous set of study results looks much more homogeneous. The reproducibility crisis in this data set disappears. Okay, so four reasons why null hypothesis significance testing have adverse influences on the appearance of reproducibility crisis. So what have people suggested to address the reproducibility crisis? You might think that they have suggested, well, let's do away with null hypothesis significance testing, but no. That suggestion has been made, but it has not or seldom been made as a solution to the reproducibility crisis. What has been proposed is a lot of rules. Rules that would affect the way you conduct your research. And I think this is critically important for the community of scientists to realize that what has been proposed to diminish the reproducibility crisis will turn into paperwork and rules and restrictions on what you can do as a scientist. So here's the reviewer guidance on rigor and transparency from the NIH with the goal of enhancing reproducibility through rigor and transparency in four areas. Here are the four areas. None of this has to do with null hypothesis significance testing. So the NIH's prescription for improving reproducibility through its funding mechanisms in no way addresses statistical inference solutions. Here is a manifesto that was published in 2017 in Nature Human Behavior of how to improve scientific reproducibility. I don't know about you, but especially living in the current political era, when someone says they have a manifesto that's going to help you, I, my fight or flight instincts go into effect. So here's their manifesto. And there are some parts that allude to significance testing. They say we need to improve methodological training. Research, design, and statistical analyses are mutually dependent. Common misperceptions, such as the interpretation of p-values, limitations of null hypothesis significance testing, so forth, uh, will be addressed. It all can be approved. We can improve this through improved statistical training. Now, I'm, I have nothing against improved statistical training. What I can tell you is I've been watching now for 30-odd years. People have been saying we need to improve statistical training that entire time. It hasn't happened. Interpretations of the p-value and particularly its misuse in null hypothesis significance testing has been common throughout my career. Calls for improved statistical training to address it date back to the first part of not this century, but the last century. Papers in the early 1900s. So I don't have a lot of hope for their manifesto. The second thing is we need more power. Studies of statistical power persistently find it below 50%. So what we need is to do meta-analyses, get people to work together. I'm all for that. I showed you earlier that power is not the problem. It's the combination of power, type 1 error rate, and innovation with a desire of reproducibility. So improving power in an innovative research enterprise will not improve reproducibility. That's just a mathematical fact. The top guidelines, which were published in Science in 2015, where they were addressing reproducibility of research, we can improve it by increasing transparency of the research products, process and products. And what they wanted was journals to adopt eight standards covered by the guidelines, which they claimed will improve reproducibility. Um, I'm an editor of epidemiology, as Tom noted. 
and we were invited to sign on to the top guidelines, and we said, no thank you. So far as I know, we were the only journal to publish our reasons for rejecting joining on to the top guidelines. So you can find that in epidemiology if you like. But realize that what this is, is eight standards that if adopted will mean paperwork for you when you submit a paper to the journal. It's already a pain in the neck, right? The forms that you have to fill out and the boxes you have to check, all the disclosures. This would be eight new ones that you would need to fill out to demonstrate that you've complied with the top guidelines. So realize that before you decide that this is a good idea. My alternative, what if we just stop significance testing? People have been saying this for a century. The American Statistical Association just came out with its second long series of papers advocating this position. If we did that, things would improve. The reproducibility crisis would diminish. So part one of my prescription is let's just stop. Discard null hypothesis significance testing in all aspects of study planning, data analysis, presentation of results, and inference. Cut it out of the scientific enterprise altogether. And instead, focus on estimation. Design studies that will yield a precise estimate of association, narrow confidence interval, quantitatively adjust those estimates and intervals for systematic error using methods that have been around since the 50s, and quantitatively incorporate prior information. These three things, in combination with abandoning null hypothesis significance testing, will improve the reproducibility of the scientific enterprise. And I think I can show you that. So here from the manifesto is the idealized model for the scientific enterprise. Now I want to say here that I find this as very sort of seventh grade earth atmosphere planetary science model for the way the scientific enterprise works, but let's play along. You generate a hypothesis, you design a study, you conduct the study and collect the data, you analyze the data and test the hypotheses, interpret the results, and then publish the study and conduct your next experiment. Right? That's the idealized scientific process. And then here's where they say it goes wrong. Failure to control for bias, low statistical power, poor quality control, p-hacking, hypothesizing after results are known, publication bias, which is a selection of studies for publication because the result is statistically significant. All of these things go away. We interrupt all of those parts if we do away with null hypothesis significance testing. Right? So we can interrupt where they say this cycle goes wrong if we do, with null, do away with significance testing. I'll show you more. So p-hacking. If you don't know what p-hacking is, p-hacking is uh, manipulating your data until you get a statistically significant result, the analytic strategies. And if you don't know how to do it, you can find out how to do it. Here in the British Journal of Pharmacology, they've given you a flowchart of the way you can do it. You begin, you analyze the data. If your result is statistically significant, then you stop and report it. Otherwise, you do some other things. You transform the data, you remove outliers, you use a different control group, different outcome variables. This is p-hacking, and people do this. Why do they do it? They do it because they're trying to get a statistically significant result. You see that right in the first step of their flowchart. If you get rid of that, you're done. You analyze the results and you present them. Here's my estimate. There's no longer a motivation for all this misbehavior. So instead of trying to control the misbehavior, why don't we take away the incentive to misbehave? Doesn't that make more sense? A lot of psychologists in the room, you can help me out. 
How about hypothesizing after the results are known? Here's an example. So someone has the hypothesis that jelly beans cause acne. Scientists investigate. There's no link between jelly beans and acne. We begin the subgroup analysis. There's no link between purple jelly beans or brown jelly beans or pink jelly beans or tan jelly beans or cyan jelly beans. But for green jelly beans, P is less than 0.05. And that turns into your media paper. Green jelly beans are linked to acne. Now, this is hypothesizing after the results are known because there was no prior hypothesis that the effect would be limited to green jelly beans. So you begin these subgroup analyses until you find a result that you like. Why do you like it? You like it because it's statistically significant. Again, the motivation for harking is to obtain a statistically significant result. So if we get rid of that motivation, get rid of all that significance testing, there's no motivation to do the subgroup analyses. And you stop here with an informative result, something that people who like jelly beans will be interested in and reassured by. It's not linked to acne. The fact that that is not a statistically significant result doesn't make it less interesting or less important. It's what we in our journal call a persuasively null result. Right? You don't have to change behavior and give up jelly beans to avoid acne. That's important. So in summary, there have been hundreds of papers in multiple disciplines, decrying the use of null hypothesis significance testing. I tried to find the papers that in some way endorsed it rigorously, and there are a handful. And the case that they usually make is that when used properly, null hypothesis significance testing does no harm. We hear that a lot in public health. Right? Gun manufacturers say that. Alcohol manufacturers say that. When used properly, it does no harm. But we have 100 years' experience telling us that it is not used properly. It can't be salvaged. And this perceived reproducibility crisis emanates substantially from this culture of null hypothesis significance testing and especially the misuse of null hypothesis significance testing. The solutions that have been proposed to improve reproducibility are going to mean work for you, and I expect are going to yield little benefit. Things are not going to get better. But I do think that abandoning this culture of null hypothesis significance testing, it's much more likely to yield real benefits and make our research enterprise more reproducible. So that's my prescription. And I will stop there and happy to engage in questions or conversations, comments. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I'm also interested in the relationship between uh, jelly beans and acne. <laughs> um, and my study involves six uh, uh, mice uh, who were fed jelly beans and none of them developed acne. Uh, the p-value there is, you know, fine. There's no statistically significant association. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not persuasively. No, fixed. that's not persuasively. So no. How do we take? Uh, how do we filter the journals and the results? Uh, if you know the the p less than 05 is the brain dead shortcut for publication. Yeah. Uh, we, given the quality of the uh, present company accepted, given the quality of editorial review, uh, what brain dead shortcut can we replace it with? Yeah. Um, so let me take that in two parts. Uh, sorry, this is going to take a little minute to get back. Uh, part, the first part of my answer is focus on estimation 
design studies that yield a precise estimate of association. Your study did not yield a precise estimate of association. Precise enough is precise enough to view the result as influential, right? Would you, is this result, because of the interval width, something that you view as evidence that might change action, lead to change in action? So it's dependent on what's already known, what's at stake, right? What kind of behavior change or policy change are we talking about? Where in the evolution of the topic are we, right? So your first study, if it's the first ever study on jelly beans and acne, that's, that's, that's at least evidence, right? But if you're publishing the 38th study, and this is the best thing you can do, you haven't added anything, right? So that is not precise. So there's no single answer on what is precise enough. It depends on what's at stake and where the topic is. Of Yeah. Uh, but that, so the, we have no shortcut. We're going to have to make the value decisions about what's important. Which I think should and by and large does come after the publication anyhow. Right? Like, so our journal, in addition to not allowing people to label results as statistically significant or not, does not allow people to make policy recommendations in their research papers. First of all, they are they're too short and not thoughtful enough, and epidemiologists don't know how to make policy recommendations. So they're just stupid throwaway sentences at the end of the discussion section, and we don't allow authors to make them for this very reason. So uh, policy comes later, based on all of the accumulated evidence, as well as consideration of costs, considerations of infringement on liberties, all the things that go into policy, right? Research papers are not the place for that. that and, and evidence is only a small part of that. So um, as for the stupid filter, 20 years ago, I might have agreed with you. In the year 2019, if you can't get something, anything published, you are not trying hard enough, <laughs> right? There are open access journals, plus one will tell you. Unless we can diagnose it as obviously fraudulent, they'll publish it. Right? That's their model, more or less. That, which I think there's some value in that. Right? I would, I'd like to get the evidence out there. I think that there has been, there's not enough editorial or review capacity for the amount of scientific research that is being published. That's a real problem. But that's a problem whether or not we hang on to sitting up against testing or not. And in fact, there are good and important results that go unpublished in prominent papers because they are not statistically significant. And you know, that is the other side of this filter coin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I see the point that you're making, that the, there, there may be uh, incentives to find the estimate that you want as opposed to a statistically significant result, and that some of the same behaviors might follow. Um, first, I think it's a little bit harder to change the estimate enough to make a real change in the inference that you're making. It's, it's possible, but um, it would require, it would require massaging of a different sort, right? Like looking at just the green jelly bean consumers, right? Um, so p hacking tends to take place when you have a result that originally, when you followed your analytic protocol, gave you like p equals 0 0.08 or something like that. What you're talking about, I think, is 
really changing from like a risk ratio of one to a risk ratio of two because you really wanted a risk ratio of two. In my experience, at least, without fraud, that's hard to do. Like actually massaging the data in a way that gives you a result that the initial protocol adjusted gives you. So yes, it's possible. I think it's possible. I think it's harder. Like in my world, at least, um, you know, we spend a lot of time worrying about confounding and control for confounding. But if, if I look at the crude result unadjusted for anything, and this is what I would infer from that, and then with adjustment, I get something that changes my inference, uh, I better have a really good explanation for why I should believe the inference from the adjusted estimate. I just don't see confounding control, adjust estimates enough to change inference in most of my work. And that gets to this point of, well, where in the, where in, where in the process are you manipulating towards a desired endpoint versus actually doing the most credible analysis of the data? I think that's a hard line to walk. But I recognize that people could have incentives for a point estimate. I don't know that, like, if you, if you just dichotomize this, which just goes against everything I've just said, but if you dichotomize this into publishing a result that's going to be interpreted as null versus a result that's going to be interpreted as causal or preventive, um, if you took away the significance testing part, because a null result can never be statistically significant, um, would there still be a layer of preference for causal and preventive effects over null effects? That's kind of what you're asking, right? Because then you would try to do your analysis, if the preference was for causal or beneficial effects, you would try to do your analysis in a way that moved you away from the null. Um, I think that might be true. Uh, unfortunately, we've never had the chance to actually observe that behavior because all of that would have been occurring in the context of the more dominant significance testing culture, right? Could people eventually learn to value a persuasively null result as much as a causal result? That, that might evolve, I don't know. One more brief question and then we're going to have to wrap up. Yes, Jan. The answer has to be brief. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, how are you, and I assume it's the other two points that are bringing us beyond roughly suggestion of 30 years ago. So, can you yeah. sort of expound upon that just a bit? So, Rothman's suggestion was to focus on estimation. The way people presented results did give us that focus, but they were still selected because the interval excluded the null. And my addition to that because actually, if you read the New England Journal of Medicine paper, Ken never said, <laughs> and don't pay attention to whether or not that interval excludes or includes the null, right? So that's an added part. And then bias adjustment and prior information adjustment, I think, are also crucial parts of what I am advocating, prescribing. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tom, for inviting me.